So I want you to work as a team. You're going to assess what's going on. Don't forget that the ABCs, air, airway breathing, control of bleeding, and all of those things, things that you know normally that are always part of response. Everything we do with this isn't all auto-injectors. We need to use your regular assessment skills as to the care of the patient as well. Kind of outline the actions and why you're doing it. Treat the patient if you need to treat the patient. If you think you're going to observe instead, just say so, so we all know what's up. Um, use your experience, use your resources. The resources are the people in this room with you, okay? Reminder, sludge is salivation, lacrimation, urination, sweating, diaphoresis, GI distress, and emesis. Um, bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm can result over time. Um, to begin with, what's happened here is this uh, dad and baby were just transferred from the stadium on a bus. A load of patients came in on a bus. Why would that be, that we would even put them on a bus, not an ambulance? Right, we don't have enough. So the bottom line is you can expect to see patients, one, coming on their own. They'll probably come, frankly, more will come on their own than in the back of an ambulance. The other thing with it, when the ambulance arrives and now you see onesies or twosies to the ED, when we're in this situation, you can expect to see seven and eight and more in the back of it. So it's not any more onesie twosie deal. And you may get them on the bus and in every other way. So in this case, this father and child came in on the bus. The dad is describing confusion and people fleeing. He's worried, he has pinpoint pupils, he has no other signs or symptoms, and the baby's quieting with a pacifier. He's tearing, right? Okay. All right. So, okay, I can tell you, I, I want you to know that we have, yeah, we have information from the field that this is sarin. Let's just clear that up right now. It is, okay? Assume that in this situation. He's one of about 50 people. And there's the with all the same symptoms. So, so, so what are we going to do? Baby was being comforted by that and doesn't have any symptoms that we were told. And so even with this clothes on, do we have if we've got protective gear on. We always found that that's the second, second part of the, uh, the deal here. So all right. fast. You got a big team to help you. What do you want to do? Good idea. Okay. Did you hear what, the, what your physician colleague said? Okay. But we need to treat him first before the contamination. Is he in, in trouble? Because he already had the second effect there. Okay. So we need to give uh, atropine first. Okay. I'd still be suspicious that baby's contaminated. If the oh, the baby. Yeah. 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 Someone's going to give you a second dose of atropine and I'm nine and ten. Is he? Are we waiting for five minutes? He's already got more severe. We're going to get the whole three doses. Jeez, Louise. Poor guy. Let's go to the different patient people. Come on. Okay. Is he seizing? Don't do the different patient. He's passing out. You need some value. You have value. Eight, nine, ten. You know, he's looking pretty crummy. There's a gurney over here. Why don't you get him on the gurney, guys, and do what you can to treat this fellow? Do you have any protective equipment? There's a gurney right here. Oh, there's a gurney right there. Okay. Okay, the dad, the dad tell, told you before he went south over there, that they were on the edge of the stadium when pandemonium, pandemonium broke out. The baby, when they come in, has small pupils, runny nose, salivation, some tightness in the chest. 
And you were so surprised. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you bend and you down. One, two, three. Okay. Four, five, You're going to be in a hurry. Seven, eight, nine. Ten. Ten. Good job. And you well, one third is based on our weight. Right now. Okay. All right. All right. Now the baby is having severe breathing difficulty, wet, diarrhea, generalized muscle twitching, weakness. Now the baby's convulsing, loss of consciousness. Okay. We have had training. You know, give that person. You could be. We could easily be directing that from the outside and have staff do it. Right. And we. And during the, you could have the decon team training, for that matter. Right. And that's what I would do. Because it's rather than to put them through, Mike, and then you got them. Yeah. I mean, you could be saying trays, you know, or I could be Mike. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 So, so how, how's, what's happening with this kid? Okay. And we're And you're bagging the baby. Okay. You're supporting the airway. And we're checking. That sounds about right to me. Okay, is baby intubated? No, we are doing it. I don't know. Make your decision. We'll intubate the baby. You're going to intubate? Okay, you're intubating the baby. Okay, stabilizing the baby. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Intubate, right? Now, the Valium pill, you said the same boy is a third. Uh, what would you do with Valium? What do you think, Mike? That's that's a lot of Valium for, for a baby. For a baby, um, ten. One milligram. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, okay. the way I used to give Valium for babies is, is, and you can't do it with obviously any of these, is you used yeah. to give it rectally. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. like, like five milligrams of Valium with a tuberculosis. Uh huh. And that, that would work beautifully. That would be the thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, we right. tried it. So, we tried one milligram. Well, you know, it seems that yeah. you remember that we, we may have other options here because the Kempac also has some uh, vials in it, right? So we could at this point, I mean, probably drop the Valium you think most appropriate in this case. Um, the, the business with using the atropine, the two-pam injectors, we really want you to understand that if we didn't have a smaller dose for these children that you need to act with an adult dose, okay? Because what you're weighing is whether you're going to do nothing or something, or something. all right? So that's how that goes. But at the point, uh, now we've gone through three atropines, you've intubated this child, you've done all these other things, we probably have time to drop the right, most appropriate dose of Valium, okay? So in this case, I want to tell you congratulations, you have saved this baby and admitted them. All right, now, there. But remember, there were how many people, how many buses, how many seats are on the bus? 50. 30. There's 30. Oh, my. So you got the rest of these people. And in this case, we will work through this infant as a group. But you can see what's going to happen if you're going to have to do it. Right? Which means that our next step, frankly, after we finish these classes, is we're going to be looking at the protocols that we could put as in place so that our clinical pharmacists and our nurses already had a protocol to begin to act with our physicians outside because we won't we won't be able to we can't we won't have the benefit of Dr. Um, Dugan or Dr. Doucette trying to evaluate these 300 people it's going to be a matter we're going to have to act under protocol and we certainly do that in ICUs all the time and things like that so that's what we would do question is yes that, um, if the child came in with just mild symptoms, so uh -huh. we didn't have to give the three doses, right. uh, do we have the pediatric? Yes. What you have is, uh, is atropen. And is that do is that duo pen there too? Uh, J uh, J okay, bring that on over here. Okay, so yes, the answer is we have atropine in pediatric doses, but we don't have what? What did we tell you we don't have? The two pam, okay. So that's the problem. We have to figure out either to. I don't think we have it in multi dose, or do we? Okay, so we're going to have to draw that up in multi dose, and we'd have our clinical pharmacists involved in helping us do that. 
And okay. And it would be the same for the Valium in that case. So that's yeah. correct. Right. That's right. Exactly. Okay? Here's the thing about mild so patients. So it's all the atrophy and pain. One is a mild patient may progress and become severe. Mm -hmm. So if you don't decide not to treat, you've got a real problem that could be worse. The other issue is That's aging. You don't know exactly what aging is, yeah, what kind of aging agent it is, whether it's a more of a soman than a sarin or whatever. And if you delay giving a two pam, the muscle weakness may can become permanent. That can make a difference between whether they have to be ventilated afterwards or not. So is it better to over medicate. So is it to matter to treat them? Exactly. Yeah, it, you don't want to. You don't want a mad patient. You don't want to treat somebody and have them end up on the ventilator because if you end up with 500 ventilated patients, you got a problem. Now, unfortunately, now comes another baby. This is another baby. And this baby, the father for this infant, says that they were deep in the stadium and there was mass confusion. It took a long time to get out. On the way, the father slipped and fell with the baby in, the, in their arms. And actually, when you look at this child, there is twitching along the arm, okay, sweating. That infant is vomiting and appears weak. What are you going to do? Same thing first. Uh, yeah. Same, Same thing? Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Who has not given an auto injector? <laughs> <laughs> you. Okay. All right. You know what? One person can use the uh, the Axipan and the other the two pan, so we all have experience. Okay. Did, you, did it click? Okay, I want you to have the experience of making it go, so it should click. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Could do it simultaneously? Yeah, um, probably, but I, you know, I think for the reason we're having it done this way is I want everybody to have the experience of using the implement. Okay? Okay. You have to use the same side. You could go on the other you side. You could go on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a long time, huh? Yeah. Okay, so we did this with some people in a conference room, and I handed them out. I said, okay, everybody, you know, do your objective. And they, it went click, and everyone, oh! Like this. Therefore, the physician that did that sprayed the pharmacist. <laughs> right? And vice versa. Right. Yeah. So that's what, what I want you to do today. You treat this child, you treat that dad, and I want you to treat yourself at least with one of these. Okay, so now. The needle, let's, the needle is about an inch long. Uh, yeah, a little shorter than yeah, that. A little, shorter. a little shorter than, little shorter than that. Shorter. And, and it's okay for the infant. Oh, yeah. And just okay. Make sure okay. The All right. So here's, here's what's happened now um, difficulty breathing, severe muscle twitching, convulsions, the baby coats. Yeah, airway support. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. CPR. All right. The issue with this child, remember I said there's sweating and vesiculations out here? What is that about? And it's kind of isolated in one area. What is that about? Liquid. Remember, this was the father that fell. Okay. And if you look actually at the dad over there, he's got bruising on his legs and so forth. It's fresh. But the bottom line is that was a liquid exposure versus a vapor. More absorption. Well, yeah, and the other thing is, you're, you guys, if it's a vapor only, I mean, there are, our potential exposure gets a little less, right? If it's liquid, then that's a matter of our coming in contact as well. Now, in the sarin attack in Tokyo, um, they had a large number of people, there's 500 of them anyway. They put them all in a conference room like this. They signed a few nurses. They said, watch the crowd. Here's some coffee for them. Look after them. Let us know if you've got a problem. Call the ED guy. Okay, so yeah. right. So that's what they did, but they didn't have anybody undress. They didn't have anybody wash. Nothing. Everybody sat there in the same clothing. They had off gassing from the clothes, and they had changes in the eye and and uh, pupil constriction in the eyes of staff, and in a couple of cases, staff who didn't feel as well. Right. But, but you, you saw also the video, there was no gloves, there was mass pandemonium, there was the poor guy going like this, like, what next? And then, frankly, many of us would have in that situation went, went oh, brother, you know, what, what is the plan here? All right, so that's why we're doing this today. So in a real situation, <laughs> it's very likely that the patients that come in are not decontaminated. That's, that's right. right. And in fact, here, here's the rule of thumb. If a patient comes in wet from the field, 
That means they wash them off in the field, but that is not decontamined, okay? You have to still decontaminate that patient outside before you bring them in the hospital, because once we take down your emergency department, we got a problem, all right? So there we, we'll wash them off, okay? Now, ambulatory people can wash off themselves with instruction, or they can start to take off their clothing under some hood things that we have. They can bag them. We can start a lot of things to move things along. However, there is still the possibility that in this situation we might start to treat them or be giving directions to the decon team to treat them as they're going through decon. That's what I was going to ask, be doing that there before we wait absolutely, the time? Bring absolutely. The don't, don't delay. You know, Remember what Dr. Doucette said, we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. So that's why, that's why regardless of whether your role is in the laboratory, as a laboratory science or a scientist or as a clinician, that you all understand what we're doing and how fast we're doing it. Because it's going to have to be a community affair. Right? It may be. Dr. Doucette. In terms of like sarin, severe exposure to sarin, if somebody has a really good dose of sarin on their inhale or on their skin, you know, death can ensue in as little as five minutes. So, you know, it's, it has to be treated very rapidly when they, when they get symptoms. So, and that's why we like the auto-injectors in that you don't have to get an IV, you don't have to have them decontaminated, and we don't even worry about um, prepping the skin side or anything like Goes that. Goes through because, Levi's, anything. Yeah, because so. if they get a wound infection, we figure they can sue the terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't forget that you got to push the stuff out of the way of your pocket. Yeah. Especially all the quarters on the wallet with keychains and everything else. Okay. Now, anybody who has not handled one of these, I want you to self-inject it at this point. This one, these two are the the duo dose. So this is we don't have this here, but you could practice in an area that did. And this is two PAM and atropine combined. And still but 10 minutes? Yeah, 10, 10 seconds. Minutes? I mean 10 yeah. seconds? So I want you to have the experience of doing it. And so you want to start with you already did number one, right? Who has not done this? I didn't. You did it? You can do it. There you go. Okay, right. One, two, three. Count out loud so you remember it. Five, six, seven, eight. And then you could team it that way, right? Somebody's helping you, you're passing stuff off. Yeah. So we get the whole. 